Good evening and welcome to the AOPA Air Safety Institute's webinar, Preparing for the Worst, Pre-Flight Survival Tips from a Combat Search and Rescue Pilot. My name is John Collins and I am the Manager of Aviation Safety Programs for the AOPA Air Safety Institute. A few housekeeping items before we begin. Uh, please make sure you've muted your microphones. And if you have any technical issues during the broadcast, we won't be able to troubleshoot them uh, during the webinar. So. Uh, we found that audio issues can usually be solved by logging out and logging back in. We will take questions throughout the presentation and we'll answer as many as we can at the end of this webinar. Use the question areas on your PC or laptop control panel, usually located to the right side of your screen, or the question mark at the top of the screen on your tablet or smartphone to submit them. There are uh, another, there's another co-organizer on the line with me this evening, and you may see her name pop up from time to time uh, in the question area. Um, also, if you are on a smartphone, uh, in order to see the presentation, you may have to slide left or right to see the slides, or and then in the opposite direction to see the webcams, although the webcams will not be on for the entire presentation. Wings credit will be available uh, for tonight's webinar and will be submitted to your faasafety.gov Wings account within 24 hours after the webinar. And a recording of tonight's webinar will be available on the Air Safety Institute webpage, www.airsafetyinstitute.org. Tonight's presenter is John Bart McGonigal. Bart is an active CFI, a veteran United States Air Force combat search and rescue pilot and a presenter for the AOPA Rusty Pilot Program. He's also one of my ASI Flight Instructor Refresher Course and Safety Seminar presenters. Now, without further ado, over to you, Bart. All right, and good evening, everybody. Thank you for being on. Man, I am excited about this. John Collins, manager of our Aviation Safety Program, thank you for the handoff. You're gonna get more from him here in a little bit, but. Uh, but let's talk about what we're doing here tonight because this is uh, this has been a lot of fun for me to build up to something like this. So on your screen, you can see there's Bart McGonigal, that's me, and there's my resume, my bullet resume on the left side, and probably the top two bullets up there are why I'm sitting in here uh, tonight to talk to you. The first one is I spent a big chunk of my adult life uh, in the air rescue business, as John said, as a combat search and rescue pilot. But also maybe more important is that I've been a CFI for longer than the time that I spent in the air rescue business. And those two vocations have kind of caused me to form an opinion uh, that I think is important to pass on to you tonight. And that is that I found that most pilots did pretty well handling the in-flight emergency and even getting the aircraft on the ground with minimal injuries. But the problem is not all of these incidents resulted in successful rescue operations. The difference in my opinion was how each pilot prepared themselves and their passengers for the unlikely but still possible event of a remote area off airport landing. So in the next 30 minutes or so, what I'd like to do is offer some tips and ideas of how to handle yourself like a pro without having to be a Navy SEAL. So as John said, we are gonna offer Wings credit for this, and we've got three pulls out here. This first one's just kind of a warm up pull, but John's gonna push that out, because uh, what we wanna do is see how many of you folks are coming out uh, attending this, uh, this webinar because you're an active Wings participant. So there's that poll, it's coming out, and uh, I'll, I'll just say a couple of things. About the, about the WINGS program is, I'll be honest with you, I didn't believe all the hype when the FAA came out with this program initially, but you know, the data is coming in, it's really interesting with this that uh, I'm starting to believe it now. I think that you are a better pilot and I think you're a safer pilot if you are an active WINGS participant because you are keeping yourself in that continuation trending mode. So congratulations, the FAA loves you for it. Your insurance comp company loves you for it. And look, if you were, uh, if you were one of these uh, folks that spent the last 15 seconds going, man, what the heck is Bart talking about? Go out to fasafety.gov, take a look at it. You might find, a, find something interesting out there. And same for CFIs. I don't know how many CFIs are on tonight, but of course there's a few carrots out there for, 
for CFIs as well. So let's see what that poll looks like. It, it looks like, wow, all right, a big chunk of you all, 67% are looks like you're regularly attending WINGS events. So congratulations for that. That's exciting. I'm glad to see that. And it's nice to see you got a handle on that poll because, man, I love these polls. It's so much easier to see you raise your hand when we're doing these things live. But this webinar is kind of fun. We'll just see how we can do it. We've got a couple more of those coming on. Okay, so look, back to the nuts and bolts of this thing. I'm on the clock here. So uh, so look, Lycoming, Continental, maybe you're even lucky enough to fly behind a PT-6. Most of the general aviation fleet all have one big problem, right? There's only one motor out front. Yeah, I know some of y'all going, oh, I got a twin Comanche, but you know the adage is, right? That just takes you to the scene of the incident, but uh, that second engine. But the truth is we know that uh, that, that stuff happens out there. And, you know, Murphy's Law says it's going to happen in the most remote possible area. It never happens conveniently that you just happen to be able to glide into that hard stand runway out there. It's going to happen out there in the remote area. And, uh, you know, since I can count on one hand how many times I was launched on a clear, beautiful VFR day to go rescue somebody, there's almost always some challenging weather conditions. And because of that, search and rescue may not be as quick as you would like them to be, right? So, well, what do we do? What do we do? Well, we prepare as a CFI. I spend a great deal of time with my primary students and certainly a great deal of time with my flight review clients because I like to talk about that possibility that we may end up in that off airport environment. And I wanna set the tone and develop a culture for them to start thinking like a single engine helicopter pilot. What in the world am I talking about? Well, if you think about single engine helicopters, they operate in kind of a high risk environment. They're almost always at 500 feet AGL. There's all these towers and wires and obstacles. And when the worst happens in that one engine that's keeping everything going, happens to kind of give up the ghost, well, things have to happen almost on instinct and by rote. In my previous flying life, we call these bold face procedures. These are things that have to happen so quick. There's no time to reference a checklist and there's no time to reference a flight manual. Once you get that done, if you still have the luxury of time to keep flying, then you can do the cleanup items and kind of address some of the ongoing considerations to meet your current situation. But like I said, I think most pilots do pretty well handling that in-flight portion of the emergency. And this webinar is gonna look at what I like to call that perfect Bob Hoover landing, right? Everyone remembers Bob Hoover's famous, timeless aviation quote, when you're faced with a forced landing, man, you fly that baby as far as you can into the crash and you're gonna stand a lot better chance of walking away from it. So I'm gonna use Bob Hoover's quote his famous timeless quote as kind of a demarcation line for the webinar that we're going through tonight. So part one, we're gonna back up a little bit before you're called upon to do that beautiful off airport remote area Bob Hoover landing. I'm gonna back up a little bit because there's some training, there's some equipping I might recommend and some preparation that once you do that perfect Bob Hoover landing, now what are we gonna do to help facilitate our rescue? And we're gonna talk about that part in June on part two, but for now, we're gonna start with Bob Hoover's famous quote and back up just a little bit so we can talk about these pre-flight survival tips. So, so let's take a look at this. Whether, <clears throat> whether you were walking around last year at, at Oshkosh and you stumbled upon the Federal Pavilion or maybe you were down at Sun and Fun or some air show that you were listening to the Coast Guard or the Civil Air Patrol or one of these folks that are involved in search and rescue a lot. I think they all kind of agree that you have two jobs as pilot in command. The first one is easy. Let's take the search out of search and rescue. Make yourself easy to find as quickly as possible. That's what we want to do. And then the second job that you have is after you've done that beautiful off airport Bob Hoover landing, be able to take care of yourself and your passengers until the rescue forces, the SAR forces show up. Now, let me just take a, a slight uh, a tangent here just for a little bit. I want to talk about what happens 
uh, in the Air Force, after you graduate UPT, undergraduate pilot training, it's pretty good programs, very fast paced. The pilots that come out of these things, you know, they're, I think they're pretty competent. And uh, it's a license to learn just like it is on the civilian side. But from there, the Air Force sends them to combat survival training. And, and just as the name kind of eludes, this is not camping with mom and dad. This isn't going with grandma and grandpa in their RV. This is, this is a tough, rigorous course. And there are times that those SEER instructors feel like they are literally beating stuff in your head. But I want to pass something to, on to you. There's a few things that they pass on to us that just stayed with us uh, our whole lives. And this one has served me quite well over the years. And I want to pass this on to you. In fact, if you don't remember anything from this webinar tonight, I want you to remember this. So listen up. If you are more than 30 minutes away from getting help, you are in a survival situation. I wanna say this one more time because this is gonna be important. I want you to remember this. If you're more than 30 minutes away from getting help, you've got to be in survival mode. It's as simple as that, it really is. I know a lot of you are like, man, that, that can't be that easy, but, but it is, it is that simple. Now. Now look, general aviation, we have, we have a problem in general aviation because good grief at any point in time, we've got private pilots, commercial pilots, CFIs, ATPs, and even student pilots out there flying in all kinds of things from flight training to cross country flying to you know, part, so other part 91 operations, ag spraying, all these things are going on. There's so many different things out there. We can't possibly build this universal kit that's going to that's gonna be able to fit for 95% of all the missions we're flying out there. We just can't do it. But what can we do? Well, we can use some common sense approaches. I like to break each particular mission down uh, to, to be able to say, where might I be where I might be more than 30 minutes away from getting help? And what can I do to extend my time as I'm waiting for rescue forces to show up? So we look for those likely situations that you're more than 30 minutes away from getting help. But we have this problem in general aviation. We can't go crazy, right? We have these useful load constraints. We can't possibly plan for every, every eventuality out there. So, all right, I know a lot of you are like, okay, Bart, what are you talking about? Well, look, every year, uh, except this year, uh, I usually go to Oshkosh, and man, I load the airplane up just like I do on most cross-country flights, right? First aid kit, fire extinguisher, personal locator beacon, I'll talk about those here a little bit, extra water blankets, that kind of stuff that I always carry when I'm flying around, particularly out in West Texas, but now I've got my airplane packed to the gills with camping gear that I can camp on the air venture grounds for a whole week next to my airplane. So, so I look at that flight between Fort Worth, Texas, and Oshkosh, Wisconsin, and I'll tell you what, if I have to land in a cornfield somewhere between Fort Worth and Oshkosh, I feel pretty comfortable with my configuration of the aircraft. I'm gonna be just fine. But look, you can't let me off that easy. You just can't let me off that easy because, because we know it's harder than that. I've been flying long enough to know that it's harder than that. So let me tell you, I used to fly a Piper Tomahawk out of Riverton, Wyoming, all small flight school out there. And you know, I would pray, I would pray that the students coming in weighed 92 pounds or less because in the summertime, man, that density altitude, you know, it's 90, 95 degrees out there on the ramp. And that little Piper Tomahawk's already kind of, you know, difficult. And so you get in there with your student, and if you're just flying a local flight, well, that's okay. You just don't put that much gas in there. But my, my problem I had at that particular flight school is the only designated flight examiner in the state of Wyoming at the time was in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. And man, let me tell you, I'm not going to give you a geography lesson tonight, but let me tell you, that is some beautiful country out there. And, and there are several places along that route of flight where even though we took off and it was 90, 95 degrees, 8,000 foot density altitude, there's three or four places along that route of flight between Riverton and Jackson Hole, Wyoming, where there's these beautiful snow-capped peaks out there along that route of flight. And so myself and my student, we take off uh, getting ready for that check ride. Of course, I've got my 15-pound Xerox box in the back of the aircraft with all the ship's records. But, you know, maybe we need to consider changing our sandals, shorts, and a t-shirt for hiking boots, jeans, and a sweatshirt in the back of the aircraft because there's three or four places that if we're called upon to do that off airport Bob Hoover perfect landing out there, 2,000 feet below those beautiful snow-capped peaks in that grassy meadow, 
we're going to have to spend some time out there uh, waiting for search and rescue to come find us. And so this is kind of giving you a feel for what I'm talking about when we want to take a look at likely situations and do what we can do within our useful load constraints. So, all right, well, let's go back to those two important jobs. The first one being got to make sure we take the search out of search and rescue. And this is going to go back a little bit to that 30 minute thing because you know, here's the here's the premise, and I know it sounds just a little too simple, but you know, someone's got to miss you, right? Someone's got to miss you, and more importantly, someone's got to know where to start looking. And I know y'all are going, man, are you kidding me? This is way too simple. But here's here's my problem: is I can look up at the NTSB files. I was just looking at one the other day, and there's a fellow that took off out of South Florida Airport. Uh, I think maybe a couple people may have saw him take off. They didn't know where he was going. And let me tell you, when he didn't show up at the end of the day, people couldn't figure out where this guy went. They looked for two months until they found that wreckage, a wreckage of the aircraft, maybe not a mile off the airport. And of course, it was a tragic outcome, but no one really knew where to where to start looking. And look, you don't have to be a run-of-the-mill general aviation pilot. You could be a world record holder, right? I mean, everyone probably remembers Mr. Steve Fawcett, right? He took off an aircraft pretty similar to that on the lower left-hand side of the screen. And uh, he was at Baron Hilton's Ranch in the Sierra Nevada Mountains, man, a beautiful place. And it was a fall morning and the wind was blowing 13 to 15 knots, which isn't an excessive amount of wind, but in that part of the country, that those types of winds can develop some fairly strong up and down drafts. And, and of course, uh, no one really knew where Mr. Fawcett was going. And, and after three and a half, four hours, they realized maybe something had gone gone wrong and, and they started this search. And look, before that, that Malaysian Air 777 thing, which is still kind of an ongoing deal, before that happened, this was the largest search and rescue event since Amelia Earhart went missing. There were so many resources put across, put out there to try and find Mr. Fawcett. And sure enough, it was like a year later, just unrelated hiker just happened to stumble across uh, some pieces, parts laying out there in the mountains. And sure enough, they put two and two together. And, uh, and it was a year later before we could find Mr. Fawcett. So again, very basic premise. Someone needs to know that you went flying. Someone needs to know where to start looking. I know that seems simple, but man, time after time, uh, we're finding more and more problems like this. So, so what can we do? What can we do? Well, here's a couple of tools. Of course, IFR flying, even if you're flying way out in the Mountain West where I, you know, I, I love the Mountain West so much, and even those rare places are becoming more and more rare that it happens to be that non-radar environment, you still got those compulsory reporting points. And so they're gonna be expecting uh, you to check in. So there's still that active tracking, but look, VFR flight following, man, I love VFR flight following. It has literally been years since I've been turned down for VFR flight following. So man, you know, Bart's opinion here is these are your tax dollars at work. You already spent these doggone things. You might as well go ahead and get something out of it. So man, use these things. I think it's a great way uh, to make sure you've got a second set of eyes. And I always say, turn this thing into a team event, right? Another way to do this, and we're approaching a poll here, but let me get this part out here real quick, is the VFR flight plan. People love this, right? You file, you activate, you fly that route. If you don't show up, we've got a pretty good idea where to go find you. Uh, there are some caveats there, right? Only works if it's activated, folks, right? We've got to activate that thing. And of course, if we were planning on going through a MOA, a restricted area, suddenly it's hot, or you just change your mind to take a different route, we've got to call flight service and give them that new ETE, new route of flight out there. So uh, so I, I want to talk real quick about the flight plan real quick. Here's my poll. John's going to push this poll out here real quick. We'll see if this one can come up. There it is. How often do you use VFR flight plan? So uh, go ahead and, and talk to that just for a minute. I'd like to, uh, I'd like to talk about this because we know last August we had to, um, we had to change our flight plans and talking to some of my FAA brothers and sisters that I occasionally talk to, it sounds like we're not doing a super good job with that. So I'd like to, uh, to try and uh, uh, advise y'all to uh, get with your friendly neighborhood CFI and, uh, and, and try and get that bottom third of that new flight plan filled out correctly. It's primarily an equipping thing that I guess people are struggling with, but 
but we need to be able to do that, file these things. It's a great, easy tool, and I think it's a great idea. I'm looking at the poll here coming up now. I don't know how many how many folks we got. About, well, we got. I'll give you just another second here. Wow, a lot of y'all, a lot of y'all are uh, are not filing flight plans. That's interesting. All right. I'll give you, there he goes. All right, so let's see what that looks like. John, pull that up real quick. So, wow, look at that, folks. 18% uh, never file a flight plan. Well, and of course, I'm, I'm talking about when you're leaving that local area out there. Uh, what I find interesting, I file, but I rarely activate it. Yeah, okay. And, uh, but only on cross-country flights. Of course, that's important. Uh, VFR flight flying exclusively. I love that, too. I love that. I, lo I do both, VFR flight filing and, and file those things. All right. Great. All right. Uh, so again, there's that new flight plan. Again, spend some time with your friendly neighborhood CFI and uh, try and get that right. You get that right on your EFB and, and then uh, the FA is happy and everyone's happy with our new flight plan format and we're IKO compliant. So, all right, moving along here. There we go. You know, I have some backcountry pilot friends and, and, uh, I don't do as much backcountry flying as I used to, but but man, I do love backcountry flying. But the interesting thing about backcountry pilots is they show up, they've got all of their survival gear on their body. You know, they've got this vest and they've got these PLBs and all these things out there strapped to them because they know how important that is. But it's interesting. A lot of people are like, man, they don't file flight plans, right? Actually, they have a, a kind of an informal network, informal flight plan they use. They they usually leave this uh, route of flight and timing, that type of stuff, with somebody knowledgeable. And they have some alternative check-ins. I'll talk a little bit about those alternative check-ins, uh, things like spider tracks and spot messenger and things like that. But of course, they, they do this because they're afraid to file and activate because where they're going, a lot of times they just don't have the ability to close that flight plan. And they don't want to start this whole fur ball with search and rescue looking for them. Um, and so I think it works. I think the backcountry pilots I know that do it, they take it seriously and, uh, and the people they leave in charge understand uh, what to do. And so I just leave you with that just for a second, because look, when my 28 year old daughter's home and I tell her I'm going to take off and go to Lubbock and she happens to look up between keeping up with the Kardashians and saying yes to the dress, she doesn't know. She doesn't know what color the airplane is. She doesn't know what direction I'm flying. But my wife, on the other hand, she knows no wind. It's 92 minutes to get to Lubbock. She knows my route of flight, the color of the aircraft, and she certainly knows what 1-800 weather brief is. And so, so just make sure if you're going to use the informal flight plan that you're leaving it with somebody that understands that kind of stuff. All right, moving along. Let's talk about Mayday calls real quick because these are important things that we want to talk about with regard to uh, working with ATC. Obviously, if you're talking to ATC, don't switch to 121.5. That's not necessary. They already know. You've already, you've already got a team event in play, right? They know you. They know where you're going. They know how you're equipped. So, so stay with them. Don't, don't go off of 121.5. But, you know, when I'm, out, when I'm flying out west in West Texas, if I've got a spare radio available, I'll listen up on 121.5 because I want to be able to help somebody if I hear somebody calling kind of in the blind out there. And I think there's a pretty good chance somebody's going to hear you on that. You might also consider that uh, that if you're next, you know, maybe 10, 15 miles away from a CTAF type airport, maybe you see, pick somebody up on that frequency. Maybe you'll pick up an FBO again. The goal of this thing is to try to get somebody to start assisting you in your situation within 30 minutes, right? That's what you try and want to, want to get done. And so I think that'll work. This fellow here that you see uh, in this Cherokee was kind of interesting. He, he was flying over Everglades National Park and he was able to get up on and get with ATC and start talking about his predicament. And of course he got on the ground, the Coast Guard helicopter showed up and started assisting this fellow for the engine even got cool. And so he did a great job. He did everything to make sure someone was gonna be there for him. And then that first part of that job is try and take the search out of search and rescue. So he did a great job with that. And a lot of successful rescue events in my life I've seen have been part of is because we were there right when the aircraft was ditching or right when the aircraft uh, whether it was an ejection or whether it was just a crash landing or something like that, because the pilot was doing everything he can to facilitate his own rescue. So it's a great job for, for him on that. But let's do a, a couple other things 
quickly I want to touch on because uh, I'm still I'm still on the clock here and I'm paying attention to it. But um, let's talk about route planning because you know if you don't have uh, if you don't have a good process uh, that you already use, here's some tips maybe that you might like. You know sometimes going GPS direct isn't the smartest thing to do. You know this is a this is actually a route of flight I've flown many many times between Albuquerque and flag uh, well this is actually Gallup but on my way between Albuquerque and Flagstaff and of course I-40 right I'm going to use a military term lines of communication if you follow I-40 it really doesn't add that much time your route of flight and of course GPS direct you're going you know right over 11,000 foot Mount Taylor there versus just flying the interstate which generally is going to stay uh, in the lower ground which is nice for most of general aviation but but also when you're called upon to do that beautiful off airport Bob Hoover landing, you can just flag down an 18 wheeler or get someone else involved to start helping you once you've done that. So I like this idea of maybe sticking uh, closer to roads or other lines of communications out there. A couple other you know, uh, ideas to think about is of course ranch land and agriculture land out there. Farmers and ranchers are generally working during the daytime. And so uh, you have a lot better chance of getting someone's attention out there in those more remote areas during the day than you do at night. Other times you may find out in the West or maybe up in Alaska or something like that, the area is just so remote and so rugged, you might consider just flying all the way around something like that just because it, it just increases your chances of somebody being there to help you and certainly a better off airport Bob Hoover landing, right? A um, couple other things. This brings up a, a thing about overwater flights, and and uh, uh, you know it, it's interesting. I talk a lot to my flight review clients and and uh, certainly my student pilots, but uh, the flight review clients. I, I always seem to spend a lot of time. I get caught up in this. I have a friend that flies between Fort Worth and Tampa quite a bit. Of course, he does it like 17 or 18 thousand feet, depending on what direction he's flying. But um, you know, I, I ask him. I said, Mandy, are you are you are you really saving that much time? versus the risk of flying out over the middle of the Gulf of Mexico, or in this case, Lake Michigan. And, uh, and of course, you know, for the CFIs on board, you're going to laugh because I know they've told you this before you've heard this from your flight review clients. Bart, the airplane don't care. Airplane don't care whether it's flying over water or flying over land, right? And, and, and frankly, I haven't really developed a proper response for that because I'm usually just, I, I, I stare at them. I, I can't even believe what I just heard. But look, Part 91 is going to let you do it if you want to do it if you uh there's no there's no stopping you there but here's what i would encourage you to to think about is make sure you're properly equipped you know have those flotation devices think about those landings particularly in a fixed gear aircraft got to get that baby nice and slow before you end up on your back and you know hopefully you've talked to your uh, passengers about man let's don't inflate this thing until we get out of the aircraft and all that kind of stuff so there's some training there's some equipping that goes into that I'm not going to tell you not to take the risk because if you're properly trained and equipped, it's probably not that uh, that big of a risk out there. But I just want you to think about that. Okay, um, let me put you in the driver's seat just for a minute, right? I'm going to put you in the pilot seat of the search aircraft just for a moment because because let me tell you, something the size of a general aviation aircraft can really get swallowed up out there, and you know, uh, looking at the, even terrain like you see out here, this forced terrain, you've got to give every clue to the search and rescue aircraft out there because they're gonna they don't typically have time to just wander around they're gonna go over that last known position uh, and they're gonna they're, if they don't immediately see a mirror flash or smoke or something like that they're that pilot not flying is gonna set up that datum point which is somewhere near that last known position and he's gonna he or she's gonna be heads down flying this search pattern and we're gonna cover every little inch of that thing and and uh I hate to say it, but man, a lot of times we picked up a, a, you know, survivors from a crash site or something. Instead of getting high fives and stuff, like, hey, thanks for being there. A lot of times we get told, hey, what the heck took you so long? You've been flying over us all day long. So just think about that, you know, mirror flashes or other ways to get the search and rescue attention out there. Again, let's minimize the search and search and rescue. And look, I talk about the Mountain West all the time, but even out east, right? Even out east, we have some problems out there because uh, you know, this was a state police helicopter that was, you know, it, it was on an IFR flight plan. In fact, it was shooting a localizer approach into Andrews Air Force Base. These folks crashed like, it was like a, a half mile from FedEx field out there. And they were even ADSB equipped. 
And uh, it still took two hours to find these folks. Now, there were some other mitigating factors out there that really caused some confusion, but, but still, just because you're in a, a more populated place doesn't mean that you're gonna be necessarily found right away. So, all right, quickly uh, moving on to electronic uh, locator transmitters. These things, 121.5. I like these things. I think these are good old radios, that, that orange, red, or yellow uh, device that's been strapped to the inside of the empennage for the, for the last uh, 30 years of your aircraft. I think they work pretty good, right? They, uh, a lot of aircraft like monitor guard, just like I do when I'm out west, west Texas, everyone's equipped with this thing. Um, but of course, we have some problems with it. One, one of them is sometimes even an easy landing can trigger that thing. Antennas can break off in a crash. And of course, sometimes even, even when you have a crash, the thing doesn't go off because it's a very rudimentary uh, G switch on that thing. And, and it's a very rudimentary inspection every year that it gets. So sometimes they just don't uh, go off when they're supposed to. But my biggest problem is the 121.5 frequency. It's just kind of you know, I hate to, I just I'm get a layman's term here. It's kind of a dirty frequency. It has a lot of problems uh, with, uh, with because these frequencies, the VHF guard, the UHF guard, and the FM guard are all multiples of each other. It causes a lot of problems and they can create a very wide search radius and a little bit of a delay there. I put this little excerpt up from uh, NOAA.gov. There's a little bit of a delay uh, in these things because sometimes they have to wait for multiple passes for the COSPIS SARSET satellite system to really kick in and give them something that they're that they can rely on and pass down to those one of those six mission control centers around the planet and then be able to get the rescue forces moving but we'll talk a, a little more about timing here in just a second the new alternative of course you can't buy the old 121.5 anymore 406 is the new kid on the block i love this it's better equipment uh better technology out there so it's fewer false alarms uh, going on. I think it's far more accurate. I'll explain that here in just a second. And because you can't buy the 121.5 anymore, you have to do the 406. They're obviously selling a lot more of this, so it's kind of a simple supply and demand. Prices have con come down a little bit. There is a, a cost to a GPS uh, upgrade on that. I'd say you're worth it. Spend the money on yourself on that because one single data burst of that GPS tag, they've got your exact lat, lat long. There is, of course, the same whip antenna that's out there on the 121.5. Um, but here's the thing, I'll just give you a quick tutorial, uh, 15 seconds on. The uh, 406 uh, frequency is picked up by a medium altitude satellite. And because they can spend more time looking at your little beeps and squeaks out there, typically in about 20 minutes, uh, the MCC can go ahead and get that location sent out to the rescue forces versus sometimes about two hours and 17 minutes on the lower altitude 121.5 satellites that are out there. So, so you stand a much better chance, get the new equipment out there. I think it's gonna work a lot better. If you're uh, thinking about splurging on yourself, do it, do it on that. Here's another good one, man, I've seen these PLBs and EPIRBs, right? EPIRBs, the marine version, PLBs, the little smaller one you can put in your back pocket. These things are great. Of course, they use the 406 frequency, so they're very effective, just like the, uh, the ones that are fixed in the aircraft. They're very portable. I love these things. Plus, stick them with you know, fire wire and then to your, your computer, then to the internet. You can upgrade these things, and they're relatively inexpensive now because there's so many out there. The only one drawback to all these things is that if you do that perfect Bob Hoover off airport landing and knock yourself out in the instrument panel, you gotta be awake, you gotta trigger that thing. But man, I love these things. I'll tell you a story about that in part two uh, about how well these things work. A few other options I wanna get to real quick because uh, I am on the clock and uh, that is uh, cell phones. I know people fly with cell phones uh, you're not going to leave home without it, so that's good. Here's what I want to tell you in part one. Keep it charged up. A charged up cell phone is extremely valuable. And here's what I'd like you to do between now and uh, when we have part two. Look at a couple apps here. There's one app called My GPS Coordinates and another app called Timestamp. And these are great apps. They're not aviation-based. It's designed like you just saw a car crash. You take a picture, it sends a timestamp and a GPS uh, or a GPS coordinates, and you text it to 911. Picture's worth a thousand words. It works for, I think it's a great thing to, to use in aviation as well, as a little selfie after you've done that perfect Bob Hoover landing and send that thing out. So we'll talk more about that in part two. Uh, ADSB, great. I'll tell you, if I get launched and I've got an ADSB last known position, man, I'm pretty confident 
that we're going to the right location to find uh, to find our, our downed aircraft. And so I love ADS-B out. Uh, another one, Spot Messenger started off life using the COSPSR satellite system kind of somewhat illegally, but they've eventually migrated to the Global Star network, which is very good. I use one of these things. I love it. And then uh, the three other ones I'll just bring out real quick, Spider Tracks, um, of course, the Iridium uh, satellite phone and the Garmin uh, Enrich Mini. I'm sure there's a few other ones out there. They all use the Iridium constellation. That really smart guy, Elon Musk, you know, he took that Iridium satellite constellation that was just supposed to fall out of the sky. It's supposed to be a temporary system. He figured out how to shoot out 20 or 30 of these shoebox sized things every time he launches one of his Dragon capsules. And, uh, and man, he has made quite a robust Iridium satellite network. We're going to talk a lot about these in part two, but man, these are great, great little devices. And I see more and more people flying with these things. All right, so look, I don't want to take away from what your CFIs have already told you, right? Fly the aircraft, find that landing spot, make sure all the passengers got their seat belts on. If you get a chance, make that Mayday call, Squawk 7700, that'll get people's attention. And then of course, you know, pop that door open. I'm not going to take anything away from that. But I will tell you, I like to put a lot of emphasis on the pre-flight briefing. The pre-flight briefings are important to me, whether it's a student, whether it's a flight review client, or whether it's just a non-flying passenger. I like to brief them all before I ever get in the aircraft on what I'm going to do and what I might ask them to do. I don't want to scare my passengers, but I think it's important that they are prepared. So if we have, a, I, my briefing goes something like this. If we have an emergency in flight, I will do everything in my power to fly the aircraft as normally as possible. And even if I think we're not going to make the airport, I'm going to attempt to make that landing as normal as possible. We may open the door just prior to touchdown. This is because the aircraft is designed to absorb a lot of the excess energy of the landing, and it could be in the airframe and jam the door. So we're gonna, we might pop that open. The electrical system may be shut down just prior to touchdown to prevent a fire. This means the intercom might not be working. That's okay. Once we stop moving, unfasten your seatbelt, check your seatmate, and let's move together, all right? I'm gonna treat the landing as normal as possible, which means I'm gonna, I'll shut down everything and I'll open the door as quickly as I can. Be aware if the aircraft was damaged or we landed on a slope, we may have to find a different exit than the point we entered from. That's okay, take you and your seatmate and exit. I'll do the same up front. If you're in the back, and we'll try and meet at the 12 o'clock position of the aircraft, if that's not accessible, let's work our ways clockwise around the aircraft then we'll meet up about 50 feet away and then we'll figure it out from there, right? That's what we're gonna do. So, so I like that. I think that's, uh, that's where I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave you on this and, uh, and just remember that, that perfect Bob Hoover landing. That's where we, that's our demarcation line that we're gonna use for part one. Once you've done that, like I said, most pilots are doing a great job. If you feel uncomfortable with that, get with your friendly neighborhood CFI and be confident in your perfect off airport Bob Hoover landing. When we get to part two, we're gonna talk about other things because there's things, first aid kits, fire extinguishers, and communication gear. Be patient, grasshopper. This concludes part one. John, I think we might have some questions. Oh, we've got quite a few questions, Bart. <laughs> uh, a lot of good ones too. So let me try to uh, let me try to sort this out. The first question that we had asked uh came early on actually before we even got started uh, a gentleman wanted to know how much water should i carry per person when flying over a remote area and, and that's kind of a pre-flight question uh might be a, a part two survival tip question i'm going to let you make the call on that part yeah we're, we'll certainly uh we're going to certainly cover that in, in part two but i will tell you that they say just sitting on your couch watching melrose place that you are going to do that. You're going to go through a liter of water just sitting on the couch. So you can imagine after you've done that perfect Bob Hoover off airport landing and you're taking care of your passengers and getting the aircraft, uh, you know, trying to get configured whether you got to spend the night out there or not, or trying to contact the rescue forces out there, you're going to go through a lot of water. So, you know, I kind of put it that way that, uh, that you want to bring as much as you can. Uh, and be able to, with the understanding that, man, just sitting on the ground, you're going to go through a leader just by breathing. So 
we have to think about that. If you're going out across West Texas in the winter time or in the summertime, yeah, you're going to need a lot as much as, you know, I would probably bring more water than almost anything else. My daughter is the only person that thinks she can't go more than two hours without food. But the fact of the matter is you can go a long time without food, very little without water. So my, the answer to that is bring as much as you possibly can. Okay, thanks. Um, we have a couple questions. A couple folks wanted to know about uh, a specific app for the cell phone for Find Your Lat Long. Um, my initial thought is probably the GPS function on there if it's working, but is there a particular app that, uh, that you've used and you like? Man, let me think. Well, of course, if you have your electronic flight bag, that's probably going to work if you're getting a signal out there the one thing I like about the two apps that I mentioned is my GPS coordinates and timestamp is it's automatically taking your GPS coordinates and of course you're taking a selfie. Uh, well, one of the things that I like is of course you know every time there's a national catastrophe, FEMA gets on, you know they're out there on TV, they're talking about this and hey, don't make voice calls, make texts because texts can travel if you don't have a great uh, a great uh, antenna nearby and you just got like one bar, you know, one X something that some network's barely working, this low resolution picture worth a thousand words has a timestamp. Uh, you're taking a selfie of you and your passengers and the wreckage and the GPS coordinates right there. So I'd say take a look at that, see if that works for you. Not really an aviation based app, but I think it might work. Okay. I have a question on the uh, the pre-flight brief. How do I best brief my passengers about the location and contents of onboard survival gear and persuade them to wear my inflatable life vest without scaring them? <laughs> yeah, you know the my my favorite thing is the is the smoke the smoke hood, right? You ever seen those things for sale? It's 40s, you know, though I can see my giving that to my wife going, "Yeah, it's all right, honey. You just put this thing over your head." Yeah. Uh yeah, it you know, it's a fine line you got to walk with your passengers, right? Cuz they're already a little bit timid about this little propeller driven airplane out there. Uh, but one thing I like, you can go out on the ASI website, we actually have a customizable um, you know, emergency equipment uh, guide, right? You can, you can fill out, a, you know, kind of put exactly where all your equipment is. I like to point it out. Here's the first aid kit. Here's what's in it. Here's the fire extinguisher. And you put that out there because if for some reason you knock yourself out during that perfect Bob Hoover off airport landing, you want them to be able to say, man, you know what? There's a card in here somewhere that showed me where all this stuff was. You know, the Ted Stevens crash up in Alaska, you know, they had a workable Iridium cell phone up there, but no one got briefed that there was that, there was that cell phone up there. And of course, it was working. The satellite phone was working, but no one really knew that was out there. Man, that probably could have saved a lot of lives. So I think it's important. You've got that type of gear. Spend the time and use that card as your guide. Pull that card out, and uh, and you've got it customized for your aircraft, and just point that to them. And like I said, you know, things that are wrote, things that you do all the time are comforting for people. So you do it the same every time you fly with them, and we have that actual emergency. You'd be amazed at how comfortable you feel because you've done it so many times. All right. A um, couple of questions here about uh, 121.5 and uh, and some comments on that. So um, first of all, first question is, is it man 24-7 or is it just by chance that someone may hear you call out? And, uh, and then also, are those calls recorded on 121.5 in case they don't hear it live? And, okay. Uh, wow. Is, is there more? Uh, no, I think those will those will probably uh, probably suffice for right now. I've got more questions though. Believe me. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Um, well, uh, look, the the uh, the Air Force Rescue Coordination Center, at Langley Air Force Base, a few years ago said, "Hey, we're no longer monitoring 121.5." Right? That was what that was their official words. Of course, they we haven't removed those satellites. Right? They're still out there flying around the Cospis Sarset satellite system architecture. Those low Earth orbiting satellites that are that are really tuned to listen to that 121.5 frequency. They're still getting through. Right? So if you have a beacon that goes off they're going to hear it and you still see the little CAP guys walking around you know when somebody had that hard landing and set that thing off so we're still working through the architecture hey there is a beacon going off and you know most of the time it's a 121 you know it's one of these 30 year things that's been strapped inside the empanage with a couple water hose clamps and it just happened to go off and so it's still working they're still working it what they're saying is they're not monitoring it that's a weird way to say it i don't like the way they put that out 
but it's still working. If you are carrying a 121.5 ELT, you will still get the word out. It may take a little longer than the 406. I highly recommend if you get a few extra dollars to, to go ahead and replace it, but it's still working. Okay, the last uh, well, the last group of questions regarding 121.5 uh, is talking about uh, you know making the suggestion of activating that that 121.5 ELT on the way down, or even the 406. Um, I know not every airplane has that capability, but if it's in there, would you advise doing that on the way down? Yeah, I think that's a great idea. Same thing if you have a PLB or an EPIRB or something like that. I'd go ahead and do that too, because there is that chance that uh, you know that you know you get a stick in the eye or something like that, and, and you're going to struggle on the ground for a little bit while you figure out what what happened uh, and setting that thing off uh, a little bit early. I think that's uh, that's not gonna that's not gonna hurt you. So if you've got that manual little switch up front that you can turn it on, I say do it. If you've got a PLB or an EPIRB or something like that, go ahead and and do that. If your passenger is you know knowledgeable on the spot messenger or one of your Iridium based devices, man, yeah, be the same thing. Hit that little 911 button, do the same thing. Just get the word out as quick as you can. Okay. Uh, a couple of comments on that. A lot of, uh, uh, some of them are saying uh, most air traffic facilities monitor 121.5 and 243.0. Uh, so if you're talking to air, uh, ATC and switch to guard, you'll probably be talking to the same controller. Uh, also, CAP still does ELT searches of the 121.5, and as you mentioned, AFRCC still monitors those. And we also just want to send a shout out to uh, some of the uh, uh, search and rescue Coast Guard auxiliary pilots, air crew, and observers from uh, Nine Whiskey Romeo, Sector Lake, Michigan. So uh, they're they're on the call as well today. We appreciate you guys showing up for that. All right, uh, so awesome. We have some we have some more questions here. Uh, Go. Somebody wanted to know what the full 406 frequency is. Do you have that out to the? <laughs> Let me see. I might have that. Point. Yeah. Uh, do I? Do I have that? Let me see. No, nuts. I don't have it. You know, I used to know what that is, but uh, I, I don't. But I, I will tell you that I love the frequency. You know, that 121.5, how we ever came up with that years ago, I don't know, but that 406 is very clean, man. It's a clean frequency and it works and it's really going to cut that time down because the new satellites that are up there are uh, are able to, to get that, hear that, your little beeps and squeaks and usually on the first pass. So I, I love, I love the new 406. I'm sorry, I don't have that. I'll try and answer that one in part two. Okay. Uh, another question here. Uh... Any recommendations for guides in case you're not immediately found other than the Air Force Survival Guide or the Air Force Pocket Survival Guide? Well, I, I'll tell you, the FAA's got a lot of good documents out there uh, for that. Um, and, and, you know, I tell people all the time that you know, there's, there's a lot of, uh, of kind of survival training out there, commercial training. You know, some of these are like ex-SEALs and you know, Army Special Forces. It's kind of rigorous. You don't have to do that. Just go take a backpacking course or or something like that. Or you know, there's a lot of free hikes in the national parks when they ever open up again. You can uh, you can get with park rangers. I mean, they they provide a lot of great information. Sometimes it's just been so long since we've been out in the woods that it's just nice to get back. Just take a backpacking class. I think sometimes that's more than enough to do what you got to do. Because like I said, the the goal is to is to try and minimize how long we have to be out there. And if we're lucky, it's less than 30 minutes and we didn't have to open up those MREs or anything like that. Yeah. <laughs> I'll also put a plug in, go ahead and volunteer with a local Boy Scout troop or uh, or a CAP squad and we'll teach you a lot of that stuff. Good, good, good groups. Um, any preference with regards to the Spot X2 or the Garmin InReach Mini SATCOM? Well, you have a uh, choice? <laughs> well I, I have a Spot. Um, I'm not sure. I think it was just because you know the spot messenger story is a very interesting story. But um, the, the global, I guess if I was going to weigh it out, the global star system is a great commercial system because of Elon Musk. I mean, the, the, the guy's a genius, right? I mean, he's, he's super smart and he has built this Iridium network into something that is quite fabulous right now. And, and although I own a spot messenger, 
I'd have to say if I didn't own a spot messenger right now, I would probably be looking at an Iridium based system because I got to believe the cost is cheaper. The best part about these new devices is you don't have to leave them on all year long. It's not like XM or something. You can just turn it on. If you know you're going to be uh, out for a month flying, uh, flying the Alaskan highway or something, turn it on and then you turn it off. You know, after that, you know, it's like I made it to Alaska. I'll be up here for a month. I'm going to turn it off and I'll turn it back on the next month. So I like that capability and, and uh, both the Global Star Spot and then and the Iridium-based systems all are very, very good. I think the messaging is better on the on the Iridium base now. So you can actually do a little bit more detailed text as opposed to 911 and I'm okay. Those, that's pretty much what you have on the spot. Okay, uh, one comment and a question regarding exiting the aircraft. The the comment is when exiting and crash if possible take the fire extinguisher and first aid kit if you can and the question is you say meet at the 12 o'clock position any particular reason well it's the start point i say meet at the 12 o'clock position just because it's a point to, to give people to think about and then if that's not accessible, work your ways clockways around the aircraft until we find that suitable location. Obviously, we don't want to go downhill because we may have ruptured that fuel tank. You know, we want to stay away from that. So we just work our way clockwise around the aircraft. Did I leave that out? I guess I should have brought that out. But 12 o'clock, work your ways clockwise around the aircraft uh, until we find a good rally point, And then we'll figure it out from there. So, so I, I just give them that as a start point. You could say meet at the meet at the uh, at the six o'clock my my problem is since i fly both airplanes and helicopters almost always we never go towards the six o'clock of the aircraft and a helicopter so I, it's maybe a force of habit on my part that meeting at that 12 o'clock or off the nose for about 50 feet has just gotten into a habit because i i definitely don't want them going to the six o'clock if i'm in a, a helicopter okay a lot of folks weighing in on the 406 megahertz frequency the actual to the third decimal point is 406.025 megahertz, although it was mentioned it is a range of frequencies around that, but that is the uh, the frequency that will receive the location information. Um, right. A suggestion from a, a another uh, listener tonight is that uh, pilots should take with them a large sheet that could be used to uh, display a ground to air signal or some kind of locating signal uh, so that's a that's a good that's a good point this is from somebody that does search and rescue from the air um, and i would echo that having done some of that myself and i know you would say anything that uh, makes you more visible is is appropriate yeah in fact i just saw um uh, i think it's one of the remote hawaiian islands a group of people got caught out there and they took a bunch of leaves and palm farms and stuff and you know form the word help out mm -hmm. there on the beach and got rescued just with using leaves out there so i, I thought that was neat the uh, question for you regarding opening the doors prior to impact does the airplane's frame lose any strength if you have those doors open prior to impact it probably depends a little bit on the aircraft but um, most of the ga aircraft that i know that you know that door opening is a uh, is built there's if you if you were able to take a look at your cessna 182 or 172 and when it's in annual and they've dropped all those panels down take a look at that door frame and you can see it's quite robust as opposed to the door which is not very robust at all so uh, i want to say the short answer to that question is no you're not doing anything maybe there's a little bit uh, you know maybe you're losing five percent of the overall strength but it's better to go ahead if it twists or something like that to not have to worry about getting that door open out there. But I think for the most part, I'm not 100% on the on the composite type aircraft that are out there, but generally the metal aircraft that you find out there, those door frames are built quite ruggedly. And I think they provide most of the structural support out there. I'm pretty sure there's an A&P out there that's gonna say, whoa, wait a minute, Bart. But uh, I mean, that's, that's what I see when I pull those panels down. I'm building an RV-14 right now, very robust around the door. So. <laughs> I'm going to stick with that answer. Okay. Uh, here's a reminder from one of our listeners. If you uh, decide to get rid of your old 121.5 ELT, please properly dispose of it. Uh, it actually says destroy it. Uh, believe it or not, he's been activated to search for a beacon and found them in a trash can on the street for pickup and found another one on a landfill under trash. And I have tracked one on an interstate 
headed north out of the Norfolk, Virginia area before and off of a boat in a cabinet under an overpass uh, next to a marina. So yeah, it's a, it's a good point. You want to make sure that. Wow, that's funny. I haven't heard that, but that, that makes yeah. sense. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, let's see. A couple more questions here. Right. We're getting into some equipment questions. Folks want to know what kind of gear to take. Whether they need a vest, is it on your better to have it on your person? That's survival gear, and the stuff that's at the back is camping gear. What uh, what do you recommend, Bart? Well, I tell you, if you if you uh, get with the Recreational Aviation Foundation or some of these backcountry organizations, man, they are staunch supporters of keeping everything on your person, right? You see them with their survival vests on, they've got maybe a little flight suits and all their big pockets, you know, like the military does and, and all that. Uh, and I don't, I, I, I don't uh, disagree with that, but I will tell you that when I'm doing flight training and you know, it's 150 degrees in the cockpit, I find that rather difficult uh, to be constantly putting on a, a survival vest and all that. So, so you kind of, you kind of weigh the consequences of, of wearing these heavy, bulky survival vests like we did in the military for every flight uh, versus, hey, can I, is this easily accessible for me if so, for some reason we're called upon to do that off airport, perfect Bob Hoover landing, can I still get to that? Uh, and, and obviously the, you know, it's, it, it's, a, it's a little bit of a risk. If you're not wearing it, you can't 100% guarantee that you're gonna get to it but you can weigh the risk. Like you said, there's the, the one question we had was how do we brief our passengers without scaring them? Obviously that's a little intimidating when you show up, you know, looking uh, like straight out of Rambo three, right? That uh, you've got every, your knife strapped to your leg and, and everything else out there. So I think it's one of these things we've got to sit there and go, well, you know what? We really just need to have a lot of water right now because we're cutting across West Texas. Um, so maybe not having, you know, you can stick a bottle of water under near the seat or something, put the rest in the back. So I think it's just one of those things you want to think through. If you're flying the Alaskan highway, man, that's a, yeah, that, that's probably a good time to think about maybe actually wearing all of your equipment on that because it's pretty rugged terrain and, and somewhat remote. So I, I think you just got to look at each in unique mission requirement that we're flying out there. Okay. I'm going to ask this last question because this is going to, uh, have tickets into our closing here, but what can we expect in part two? Well, you know, we use Bob Hoover's uh, famous quote, uh, you know, fly that baby as far as you can into the into the crash and you're gonna stand a lot better chance of walking away from that. And like I said, I think people do a really good job with that. Pilots do a good job with that, generally speaking. So we're not gonna spend a lot of time talking about that Bob Hoover uh, landing because your CFIs do that for you and your flight reviews, your primary training. So what we're going to do though, now we've talked a little bit about some extra training, equipping and preparation. Now we're going to talk about is what can we do to go back to those two main jobs, right? Being able to take the search out of search and rescue or at least minimize that search effort and then be able to take care of yourself and your passengers, right? There's a lot that goes on to that. Uh, from just the mental attitude to making sure that you've done a little bit extra than just checking on that first aid kit every year, that you actually know how to use that and what's in it, and we can take care of our folks because we took them out there, and it's really incumbent on us to keep them uh, in good spirits and keep them alive uh, for SAR to show up. So that's what we're going to focus on. It's kind of, I guess you could call it, okay, you've done that great Bob Hoover landing, now what? So that's where we're going to start. We're going to start at now what? Okay, that sounds good. Any any uh, final comments, Bart? No, oh, man, I really appreciate every com everyone coming on tonight. Thanks so much. I'd so much rather have you all here in person, but this worked pretty good too. I hope you all enjoyed it. All right, thank you, Bart. Appreciate that. And I know we had a lot of questions. Folks want to know when is part two. So let me tell you about that. <laughs> good one. Uh, yeah. Next month. June 25th at uh, 7 p.m. Eastern. Uh, you'll see an announcement on the AOPA Air Safety Institute website, and you can sign up again through the GoToWebinar app. Uh, that will be preparing for the worst part two post-crash survival tips from a combat SAR pilot. I think we've got a pretty good speaker lined up for that. Yeah, it's Bart McGonigal again. So Yay. You know, we'll enjoy a, enjoy a second seminar from him, and we'll address some of the questions that we didn't get to tonight in that seminar. Uh, webinar and uh, we just want to say thank you again for for attending if you've enjoyed this if you like this everything we do at the Air Safety Institute is funded through generous donations 
from pilots and aviation enthusiasts like yourselves. Uh, if you go to www.aopafoundation.org slash donate, you can make a donation there. Um, and uh, we'd appreciate that. So from all of us here at the Air, Air Safety Institute, myself, Bart, and everybody in Frederick, actually scattered to our homes, uh, have a great evening and fly safe. Good night. Right, be, be safe, y'all.